1995, people believed that virtual reality would be everywhere within five to 10 years. Were you one of those believers? I was. Over the last 12 to 18 months, the largest companies in the world have, have realized this is important for their consumer business. They are planning their future with the metaverse as a significant part of it. You started the foundation for what we now call augmented reality. And now you are operating in the field of artificial intelligence. AI that have access to our personal history that knows our likes, our tendencies, it knows how we're most likely to be persuaded. It's reading our facial expressions, maybe even our heart rate, blood pressure. There needs to be some guardrails in place because utopian vision could get distorted. Hi, I'm Nick Rosa from Accenture. And I'm Daniel Colleani from AIXR. This is Feel the Beat. So, Luis, you are one of the pioneers in the field of augmented and virtual reality. Tell us a little bit more about your career and your beginnings. So I got involved in the metaverse over 30 years ago, back at the early beginning. I started as a researcher at NASA, working on virtual reality vision systems. And so my first work was to model interocular distance, or the distance between your eyes, writing software and spending a lot of time using various vision systems. And um, I was immediately captivated by the potential of virtual worlds. I felt confident that it was going to change society. And so I was very excited from the start. At the same time, spending lots of time in, in a virtual reality, I also didn't like being cut off from the real world. I felt like uh, the experience was amazing, but I also felt like it was isolating from my natural experiences. And so the real first thing that I felt was I wish I could take the power of VR and just splash it all over the real world. And this was back before the phrase augmented reality was in use. I pitched it to the U.S. Air Force and I was fortunate enough that they funded me to build the first really functional augmented reality system. Uh, it was called the Virtual Fixtures Platform. A crazy system, it required about a million dollars worth of hardware. It had a vision system hanging from the ceiling. It had a big exoskeleton that, that people would wear. You might've seen pictures of it. The exoskeleton would track your hand motions and feedback, haptic feedback. And so this was a fully functional system, meaning it was for the first time people could reach out and interact with a really a mixed reality of the real world and the virtual world together, where you could have a virtual object bump into a real object and, and have this true augmented reality, mixed reality experience. And, and so that was, again, a, a great, really a, a great experience for me and really got me even more excited about the field, but really the most important thing to my career was that that was a set of experiments where I brought in all kinds of people just off the street to, to experience it. Cause I was running research studies to see if, if augmented reality could enhance human performance. And so these people would come in, they'd get into the exoskeleton, they would do the tests. And then, and then every single one of them would get out and say, oh, like that was amazing. This was in 1992, so 30 years ago. And, and so I didn't think it would take 30 years, but I did feel like virtual reality and augmented reality were going to change the world. And so I went back to Silicon Valley and I founded a company called Immersion Corporation, which was one of the early VR companies. And, um, we built some of really the first virtual reality simulators for medical schools where doctors could train in VR and, and the company kept selling them for decades. Immersion went public in 1999. I think it's the oldest virtual reality company in the world from the early days. I founded my current company, Unanimous AI, which is an artificial intelligence company that focuses on amplifying group intelligence in shared environments and really focused on the human side of things. In the second part of our podcast, when we're mm -hmm. going to really deep dive into this potential danger of the metaverse, I would like to go a little bit back and some stories about the early days, the real early days of augmented and virtual reality. Virtual reality got it, its real start in the late eighties. I was fortunate enough to, to get into a lab at Stanford called the Center for Design Research, which had, had a handful of other researchers looking at virtual reality looking at telepresence, augmented reality didn't exist. Back then we would think of current technology as television and people had spent decades learning about frame rate and learning about the other basic perceptual capabilities that what kind of frame rate do you need to, so television looks smooth. Back in the late eighties and early nineties, people were asking those same questions about immersive worlds. What kind of update rates do you need so that when you move your head, you don't get 
nauseous? What kind of, how accurately do you have to be able to model interocular distance to get good depth perception? All of these you know, really basic parameters were under, were research topics mm. back then between 92 and 95, virtual reality really took off in the public consciousness. And people don't really realize that. Like people today, at least, they don't realize that in 1995, virtual reality was on the cover of Wired magazine with, with a statement saying, this is the next big thing. People really believed back then, 95, people believed that virtual reality would be everywhere within five to 10 years. Were you one of those believers? I was. When I founded my first VR company, which was, 1993, I believed that by 2000, seven years, you know, virtual reality would be everywhere. And venture capitalists believed that as well in the early 90s. It was a really hot topic. And then around 1997, it just fell off the edge of the world. And you couldn't even mention the word virtual reality mm -hmm. to venture capitalists. And people often ask, what happened? Why did that happen? What happened was the internet happened, which is an important critical technology for, for virtual worlds, but you, the dot-com boom happened where every ounce of excitement, every dollar of venture capital went into just building basic flat businesses and, and virtual reality fell out of favor for over a decade, I think about 15 years. This is going to be my question to you is you're sitting there in 2012. And you're hearing now about a VR that is going to be the next biggest thing. Were you sitting there thinking, oh no, not this again? Or were you sitting there thinking, yeah, now is the time? In 2012, when it started to come back, and it was really around 2014 that it was, that really, you started to see the same kind of hype that we saw in maybe 1995. At that time, 2014, I was working as a professor at California State University. And I was teaching courses in entrepreneurship and I was actually advising a variety of companies. And I ended up in advising some, some student startups in the world of VR. I you know, distinctly remember saying the one thing that I learned in this space is that it, things take longer than you expect. To me, the hype around it in the early 2010s felt, okay, we're getting closer. But it's probably a, a little overly optimistic. And, and my advice to startups at that time was prepare to be in it, to stay in it for the long hall because you're not going to have a business plan that, that realizes itself in three years. So you should, again, be on a, a seven-year plan. And my personal view is that this time it's real. This time it's, the industry is really coalesced around the concept, not just startups, not just venture capitalists, but major corporations are investing in the metaverse in a way where it really will happen at that level that that realizes all the excitement that people had, you know, 30 years ago. Over the last 12 to 18 months, the really the largest companies in the world have, have realized that this is important for their consumer business. This is important for mainstream computing. They are planning their future with the metaverse as a significant part of it. I see there being a, a virtual metaverse and an augmented metaverse, where the virtual metaverse is the, these fully simulated worlds, people are avatars, and the augmented metaverse being a virtual layer over the real world. And the reason I split it up in, in my mind is that it's really um, two different industries that evolve in parallel. And they're coming from, they're evolving out of existing industries. I see the virtual metaverse evolving out of uh, the gaming industry and social media industry, whereas it's the virtual metaverse, fully virtual worlds will evolve really focused on socializing, entertainment, shopping, gaming in fully simulated worlds, whereas the augmented metaverse is really evolving out of the mobile phone industry. It's evolving where the handheld phone will turn into augmented reality eyewear and, and it's really about mobile media. And it's different players, different focus, different interactions. I see both of those happening in, in parallel. Uh, in my personal view is it's actually easier to predict the augmented metaverse as looking at the time frame of how things evolve. It's easier to predict a very rapid adoption of the augmented metaverse, whereas the fully virtual metaverse is a little bit harder to predict because it really depends on people wanting to spend significant amounts of time in fully simulated worlds. This is interesting because a lot of people think that the metaverse is only virtual worlds 
obviously the most interesting aspect of the metaverse is being able to bring digital content into the real world. So creating this kind of a connection between what is digital and what is real. Uh, but probably one of the most fascinating aspects of this is that if you think about it right now, and you're talking about the, the augmented metaverse will be the evolution of the mobile market. If you think about the situation right now is that our life without a mobile phone is way less meaningful than where we are a mobile phone because we're more connected. We can do more things. We can work, we can connect with our friends. We can check the news. We have data and information coming towards us in the future. This is going to be probably important or vital because it's going to be also connected directly to the meaning of reality itself. Really the metaverse is this transition from uh, information being stuck on this little flat window in your hand to information being placed into the world in a natural intuitive uh, locations at the location that you want it. And so I, I really do see uh, the augmented metaverse as being a, a humanizing technology that will put information into the form that our perceptual system was designed to perceive it as spatial yeah. content all around us. The content should just be there. And the potential of augmented, augmented reality, the augmented metaverse is, is so extreme to make your world more natural. And it doesn't have the downsides of cutting you off from the real world. And the way I like to think of the adoption path is this thing. Okay. If you go back to, I think 2007, everybody was using flip phones and nobody thought they needed a smartphone yep. and nobody thought they would ever spend a thousand dollars for a phone. And then Apple launches the iPhone. Within five, six years, smartphones went from zero to completely replacing the flip phone market, despite the fact that it was significantly more expensive. When major, major corporations launch augmented reality eyewear, you could see the same exact kind of transition happening, which is first it'll be supported by, by developers creating interesting content. When Apple launches augmented reality eyewear and there's interesting creative content, it will very quickly get to the point where People who don't have that eyewear will feel like they're missing out on content. They'll actually sure. feel, they'll actually feel it even more intensely than the difference between a smartphone and a flip phone, because they literally will be things in their world they can't even see. By the early 2030s, we could really see an, an augmented metaverse that is really changing society, changing how people, uh, live. You have been one of the pioneers in the field of virtual reality. You started the foundation for what we now call augmented reality. And now you are operating in the field of artificial intelligence. Can you tell us a little bit more about your first steps and why you got into AI? Yeah, my, my PhD and my background and my interest is really in technologies that can be used to, to amplify human abilities. So I mean, my interest is really in this interface between, between humans and computers. And, and so my interest initially in, in virtual reality and augmented reality was to use this technology to allow people to, to perform tasks better. And for a long time, I was really focused on how to use technology to make, to enhance a single individual's performance, the virtual fixtures platform that I built at the Air Force was about, can I allow people to, like, to perform manual tasks with augmented reality and they could perform that task faster and better? About 10 years ago, I started really thinking about not just individuals, but groups of people. And, and can, can we use technology to, to enable groups of people to perform better? And, and that's when I started like, like, looking at artificial intelligence saying, can we use AI to connect groups of people together better so that we can, groups can make better decisions and better predictions and better forecasts. And that's really led me down this path of using AI really in a unique way, which is to connect groups of people together and make them collectively smarter. We, we developed a technology that we call Swarm AI and we call it Swarm AI because one of the things that, that I did 10 years ago was really thinking about how can you make groups more intelligent and like many you know, types of, of technology, it's always useful to go back and look at nature. Now, how does nature do it? And it turns out that nature has spent hundreds of millions of years evolving methods where large groups can actually optimize their combined intelligence and biologists call it swarm intelligence and swarm intelligence is the reason why birds flock and fish school and bees swarm. They are significantly smarter together than alone. They make much better decisions. And so it's, if, so it's, in terms of swarm intelligence, you can think of a school of fish, a school of fish 
They could be thousands of individuals. They each have a slightly different view of their world. They each have slightly different historical memories of their experiences. They have slightly different personalities. No one's in charge. There's no fish that's in charge. And yet this school of fish can navigate the ocean and make good decisions and, and be a successful species for hundreds of millions of years by working together as a system. They don't take a vote. They don't take a poll. There's, they don't take a survey. There's, they work as a real-time system, pushing and pulling on each other by, with little signals that allow the group to make, to make really good decisions. And biologists would call them a super organism. And so when I founded Unanimous AI seven years ago, um, I said, if birds and bees and fish can get smarter in these systems, can we use AI to allow groups of people to come together in these systems? And so we built this system called Swarm. We see that groups of people making forecasts or making decisions can get 30, 40% more accurate when they're working together as a swarm, as this interactive system with AI watching their behaviors than um, if they just took a vote or a poll or a survey. And an example, we did a, a, a study with, with a MIT where we looked at groups of traders, financial traders, and we had them predict the price of gold, the price of oil, the S&P 500, and then they would do it alone, or they would do it just by taking a group vote, or they would do it as a swarm. And as a swarm, there's a constraint. They have to all be connected at the same time. It's a real-time system that they would log in. It would question would come up. That's the price of oil in the next seven days. And then we had these groups do this every week for 20 consecutive weeks. And the groups that used, that worked together as a swarm were, I think, 30% more accurate in forecasting uh, oil and gold in the S&P than the traditional methods. And I have a question about it immediately, which is, does the system become more accurate with more people added to the system? So we had that exact same question first, which was how many people do you need? And I originally assumed that you would need at least 50 people, maybe a hundred people. We looked at swarms of bees, swarms of bees. It's interesting because a bee colony has about 10,000 members. And they make these remarkable decisions. They will decide on new homes to move into and things as a swarm, but they only use about 300 members at, out of the 10,000. And so it made us think like, there's probably, you don't have to, you don't have to keep adding members. At least nature suggests that. And what we found was it depends on the type of question and the type of population, but usually between 30 and 60 people is really good to get a very accurate forecast from members of the general public. We've done every year, we get asked by journalists to predict the Oscars. Just using members of the general public as a, an example, we'll take in 50 movie fans and we'll predict the Oscars. And every year we'll outperform the movie critics at the New York Times and the LA Post and, the, at, and Variety and Vanity Fair, because people are smart and when you combine their insights, they get smarter. The thing that surprised me the most was that it, when you have real experts, people who are not just members of the public, trained professionals, you can get down to pretty small groups. We did a study with Stanford Medical School that was funded by NSF, where we brought in groups of doctors and we had them diagnose chest x-rays as a swarm. And, and so the, these doctors would either just work on their own and make a diagnosis, or they would take a vote by a survey or they would log in together and as a swarm converge on a diagnosis. And so an x-ray would pop up on their screen and then they would swarm and converge. And the study that we published with Stanford in the journal Nature Digital Medicine showed that when working together as a swarm, the doctors could reduce their diagnostic errors by over 30%. And it was just four or five doctors. It wasn't 30, it wasn't 50. You had these experts, it was just four or five people working together as a system could make a significant improvement. Given your background, obviously, with immersive technology there and with virtual reality, augmented reality, and obviously we're discussing this brave new world of the metaverse, how do you potentially foresee the technology and convergence of artificial intelligence, like the one that you're creating or working with, and this world of the metaverse? Artificial intelligence will be one of the most significant technologies in the metaverse, for good and bad. And the, the Technologies that, that I focus on are really about connecting groups of people in real time. The one constraint when you get a group of people as a swarm is they have to all be connected together at once, which immersive worlds are great for. Immersive worlds are really about real time interactions. The metaverse is a world where we will be, have the ability to collect massive amounts of information about people. And we can talk about that in more detail, but artificial intelligence is very often used 
to, to characterize people and profile people. And it's being used in traditional web two world to crunch lots of data and then understand things about people. I think AI will be able to understand things about people even far more in the metaverse because it will, we will have a world where people are, are being tracked in lots of different ways. And so I think that's interesting. I think, I think we will learn about people. I also think it gets dangerous because we could start to profile people at levels that become maybe predatory. And so that's one area. The, the other area that AI becomes really significant is there will be AI controlled avatars in the metaverse. There will be AI controlled agents, avatars, they will be conversational and, and they will be very good at what they do, with, especially with the very recent surge of progress in large language models, the prospect that you could interact with a, a virtual AI controlled spokesperson and not even realize that person's not real is, is definitely within our reach, especially in a virtual world where everybody looks like an avatar. If you were approached by an avatar that looks just as real as everybody else, and it's, it's powered by a large language model. It will be able to interact with you in ways that make you think it's real. And that's really interesting. At the same time, it's also dangerous. It's dangerous because the most likely usage of that type of AI powered avatar is for promotional purposes as AI powered spokespeople that are going to engage you in promotional conversation with the goal of persuading you to buy a product or service, or even worse, persuading you to believe an idea that that some third party has paid to, to influence you. And just like advertising in today's world, in flat media, this type of advertising in the metaverse will be targeted. And so you will be approached by an AI powered avatar that will be custom designed to, to be most persuasive to you. The way it looks, its voice, its mannerisms, its clothing will be all be chosen based on your profile. And, and it will gauge you in a conversation about a product or service or political propaganda, and it will be very persuasive. And that use of AI, I think is very dangerous, especially because in the metaverse, that AI will also have access to your facial features, your vocal inflections, maybe even some of your vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate. And so we could find ourselves in a virtual future where we're engaged by virtual spokespeople that are driven by AI, that have access to our personal history, that knows our likes, our tendencies, it knows how we're most likely to be persuaded. It's reading our facial expressions, maybe even our heart rate, and blood pressure. The whole point of virtual reality and augmented reality is to blur the boundaries between what's authentic and what's not. Lewis, do you, I guess, feel a sense of responsibility for, for that area of, of the growth of the metaverse, given the fact that you're largely responsible for a lot of the early pioneering and early growth when these concerns probably weren't majorly a thing. People who've been promoting the technology for a long time have a responsibility to say, hey, this has the potential to, to make this magical world, but there needs to be some guardrails in place because utopian vision could get distorted. And I think for a lot of people, you can look at what happened with social media and say, hey, things don't always turn out the way you expect. Social media. It's a great concept, had utopian vision, a lot of really utopian benefits, brings the world together, gave a voice to the billions of people. It had the potential to democratize society, but at the same time, there were no guardrails in place on social oh. media. And so it has created these, created inadvertently a system that also polarizes society and spreads misinformation and disinformation. And I think we can learn from that and say, hey. Let's think about both the good and the bad so that we don't have another utopian technology that. Well, that I was going to say, because like you, you know, rather famously, you have people like, I guess, Bill Gates and like Mark Cuban, who in the past have like vo vocally limited, I guess, like screen time for their children to use just like mobile phones. I think and Bill Gates wouldn't let his children have a phone until they were over the age of 14, which in 20, 2007, so I guess that's a. That's the sign of the age there, but would you let, I guess, your children use virtual reality? Would you let them enter the metaverse? What's your opinion on that? Two answers to that. One is I think children or young people are going to use technology where other young people are. And if you 
restrict them, you're actually creating social problems for them. And so they don't necessarily have a choice. And in some sense, they're, they're the head of the, of the curve. And because right now, the people who are in the metaverse right now, the most are pretty young people in Minecraft and Roblox. Like those are real metaverse worlds. And there's a whole generation growing up in Minecraft and Roblox. And at the other side of it, ultimately, whether you could steer people away from using the metaverse right now while it's in this transition, it will get to a point where people will not have a choice. People do not have a choice right now, really, to use a smartphone. They don't have a choice but to use the internet. You will be at a disadvantage if you don't have augmented reality. You'll be at a disadvantage if you can't do shopping in virtual reality. I have a question about this. What is, from your point of view, like the top three or top five things that should happen in order to protect the consumers and the metaverse users in the future? And also, how do you see this implemented? Do you see this implemented on a platform level? Do you see this implemented on a country governance level? Or do you see this implemented like a sort of a United Nation the human, digital human rights kind of declaration. I think the way it's implemented could be all, all of the above. It could be platform, it could be government, it could be uh, digital human rights. I do think that the concerns that I have are in terms of where regulation would happen is really about putting guardrails on, on what, on the platforms themselves. And what are those the guardrails? Do you have like top three or top five things? Yeah, so, to protect so one broad category is tracking, right? So again, by its very nature, the metaverse has to know where you are, right? It has to know where you are, your orientation. It could be tracking your gait, your posture. That has to know that stuff to, in order to simulate the world around you. It doesn't have to store that information. And limitations on, and by storage, I mean, it doesn't have to store that information over time. It needs that information in order to simulate an experience in real time. And so I think limitations on tracking really go to storing information over time and giving the ability to profile people. Because again, and this is where AI comes in, if you have the ability to track these motions throughout their day after day, you could then use AI to then predict their behaviors. You could use AI on that motion data to, to, prop, to actually predict health problems. Putting limits on um, making a clear distinction between the data that's needed for real time, providing a real time simulated immersive experience that is magical and educational and informative. I think that's fully possible. I think we don't have to store that information over time. So that's the input side. The output side, metaverse platforms will have the ability to take whatever information they have about you, profiles about you, and then target you with content, with advertising, just like in social media. The thing that's really different about targeted content in the metaverse versus targeted content in social media is that in today's world, when an advertisement pops up, it's very clear it's an advertisement. It's a, it's a pop-up ad, it's a video. In the metaverse, advertising will become immersive. It will go from flat content to immersive experiences. And so when advertisements and promotion and propaganda become experiences, it could become indistinguishable from real, from other real events, real activities in that world. An example that I could give of I, what I would call a, a promotionally altered experience. Imagine you're walking down the street in, in a virtual world or maybe in the augmented world and, and you see a parked car you've never seen before and you, you notice it. And then two people are standing outside the car having a conversation about it. And they're talk, the driver's telling their friend how amazing that, that this new car is. And, and you just, you walk past and you might just think that was an authentic experience and it could subconsciously influence you and say, oh, like people who live around here really think that this, this car has these great features. And you might not realize, no, that was injected into your world as a targeted advertisement. Only you saw that experience and they chose the color of the car and they chose the virtual spokespeople, their gender and their clothing, baked all to maximize persuasion on you. And you might have no idea of it. So this idea of these prom promotionally altered experiences will happen in the metaverse and they could be indistinguishable from authentic experiences. And that's really dangerous because it changes yeah. your view of reality. If something is a targeted promotional experience, it should look different. It should look different. It should sound different. I, the consumer, I, the user should be able to see when I see that virtual car and people talking, yeah, that's fine. Hey, but if it looks five. different, yeah, if it looks different, if it just, 
aesthetically looks different and I go, oh, I, that's promotional. I can then put it in the proper context and use my natural skepticism to say, yeah, that was placed there. I think that we could go on for hours on this topic. I was going to say, this is fascinating. I like, I'm just taking in all, sucking in all the knowledge. <laughs> I just wanted to, to add something on top of this. That's you're talking a lot about automated profiling system that can potentially, you know, ask people to purchase products and persuade people in, on the metaverse to invest money on products. But my take on this is not just that this can happen only with automated system. This could potentially happen also with actors that are real people that are going in the metaverse, knowing something about you and doing this in real life. So it's not just a matter of fact of what is going to be automated in the metaverse that needs to appear as a paid for advertising, but also that there's a, there are some regulation that need to happen also in the terms of behaviors of real people that should be tracked and some should put some measure and some chaperone in place in order to protect their inhabitants from this kind of behaviors. There's really important reasons to have strict controls around identity. All that said, that I do want to point out that even though you could do this with human actors, AI controlled avatars will ultimately be far more powerful and also cheaper to implement. And I say that because at scale, at scale, but even, um, even just a one-on-one, -on -one, it's powerful. Meta just announced that they're putting facial rec facial tracking, expression tracking in their new yep. headset. And there's a really good reason for doing that. If you put facial tracking on a headset, now your avatar could express human emotions. It's a humanizing thing. It's positive. On the other hand, if they can use uh, emotional analysis in real-time advertising, now this AI-controlled avatar that's engaging you in promotional conversation will adjust its tactics in real time based on the emotions you're expressing. And it turns out that AI is actually better at detecting emotions potentially than humans because an AI can actually detect what are called micro expressions mm -hmm. that happen so quickly or so subtly that a human salesperson wouldn't recognize it, but the AI can. I think that consumers would, would appreciate if there were guardrails in place that said, hey, you can't use emotion detection in real time to, to ad adapt advertisements. And I think the platforms would benefit because if consumers lose trust, then it hurts, it hurts the whole industry. And if you put guardrails in place and people so, feel safe in the metaverse, that's good for the whole industry. So Lewis, we're, we've just about hit our time now. And I was going to say to Nick, this definitely is a, a part two. You could have a whole conversation about this just final topic here. This has been absolutely fascinating to me. And I'm sure to our listeners and viewers, this also has been very interesting as well. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It was, it was great. Did you know you can catch this full episode of Field of View and more by subscribing on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. To not miss another immersive technology moment, subscribe today.